part one of a two-part interview with author Simon Seabag Montefiore. He joins us to discuss his book, Stalin, The Court of the Red Czar. Simon Seabag Montefiore, author of Stalin. I read an article about you, where, where actually you wrote it, and you said, I, be, I became so immersed in this world that I had nightmares writing this book, and now on publication they have only just stopped. And I know this was publicized over a year ago in England. Uh, nightmares? Why? Stalin was always, Stalin was always obsessed with um, how people behaved at the supreme moment, execution. And though he never attended any uh, torture, any, um, any executions himself, he always wanted to know how did they, how did they behave at the supreme moment. And um, so obviously I had to pay attention to some of the stories of how people behaved as they were about to be shot. And some were brave, some, some spat at their executioners, some died praising Stalin, and some just lost it and, and um, wept and kissed the boots of their um, executioners. Um, and um, of course this, this entered my mind as did all of this stuff. I mean, this whole weird world entered my mind, and I began to have nightmares about it throughout the writing of this book. I have to admit, I lost track through the book. There's so many names, so many stories. What, how did you, you set it up when you went into it so that you could keep track of all this? Well, you know, what I wanted to do was show Stalin in a completely new light. And in fact, you know, some, some, some reviewers have said, and, and that they've got the point, that this is the first intimate biography of Stalin and his, and his people around him, and that, that's what it is. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's intimate, it's private, um, it's, the, it's the inner circle, it's the inner world. I mean, we never knew any of this stuff before. And I must say, the result is unsettling. It's, it's a picture of, it's a chronicle of, like, debauchery, depravity, sadism, murder, um, luxury, power, privilege. Um, and these were really the most diabolical people ever to run a country, except the Nazis, I think. I want to show a picture of Nadia Stalin and ask you who she was and how many wives did Stalin have? Yeah. Um, Nadia was um, Stalin's much younger wife, um, 30 years younger than him. And um, there she is um, uh, on her deathbed. Um, and she was, um, she was the child of Bolshevik a Bolshevik family. Stalin may well have had an affair with her mother um, it, um, when she was three years old. And um, Stalin had known her for all her life, obviously, except after she was three. He was said to have um, uh, rescued her from, from, from drowning as a child. When did she die? She died in 1932, the 8th of November, and she committed suicide. How? It was on the evening of a great party. Um, the Bolsheviks were great partiers. They had a great party at the Voroshilov's flat, uh, flat in, the, in the Kremlin, and afterwards she argued with Stalin. She went out, she went back to her flat, and she shot herself with a pistol. And, um, and no one found her till morning. And when Stalin was, 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 was informed, he was absolutely polaxed by it. How long had they been married? Um, they'd been married for 20, 12 years or so, just over, since, since 1918. And what was the difference in age? about 25, 30 years. And uh, what was the relationship like? It was like, it was a mosaic of like misery. Um, she was a schizophrenic, she had psychological problems. Um, he was of course impossible, rough, egocentric. So it was like moments of great happiness and we have all the love letters in the book which, which are fascinating. I mean that's one of the great things about this treasure trove of, of, of material on which the book's based. Um, and other times, you know, great unhappiness, great happiness, great love, um, and also sort of um, a, rising, um, a rising disquiet leading to this tragic end. His first marriage? First marriage, Kato Svanidze, young educated girl, Georgian, dies after just two years of marriage of tuberculosis. Um, he afterwards says, I'll never recover from this. My stony heart um, will never recover, will be cold forever. And did he marry again? Yeah, he, then he married Nadia. I mean, but after that? No, there was a lot of stories that he'd married a, Jew, a Jewish wife, the, the sister of um, Kaganovich, one of his closest, um, closest colleagues, who was Jewish. And it was put around by the Nazis. But in fact, he was surrounded by Jewish women, you know, throughout the um, 30s, but he didn't marry again. He started an affair with his sister-in-law after Nadia's death. And when that finished, he then began a, a secret affair with his housekeeper, Velechka. 
How was it secret, and when did you find out about it? Now, that's fascinating. I mean, no one had really, you know, no one really found out much about Valetchka, but in fact, she was a smiling, easygoing, um, very discreet peasant woman who, um, who adored Stalin. And she looked after Stalin's, um, she, she, all his appetites, his daughter said. She looked after his cooking, she looked after, she folded up his underwear, which she was very proud of. He liked everything kept very tidy. Um, she, she ironed his tunics, and she was always smiling. And she never discussed politics with him unless he asked her. And there were various moments in the history of this, story, this amazing um, country when she, he did actually consult Valetchka. Um, for example, when he was about to leave Moscow in uh, October 1941, great mo decisive moment of the war, and um, a moment which could have changed the whole history of, 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 of our time, um, he said to her, what do the common people say, Valetchka? What's everyone saying? Should we leave Moscow? And she said, absolutely not, she said. And that was, made an impression on him. But, of course, the irony was that when, when Churchill and people like that were with Stalin, they were meeting with Stalin, and this girl, this sort of buxom um, peasant woman came in in her white uh, tunic serving the food, none of them realised that this woman was Stalin's secret mistress. You say in one of the footnotes that she never talked about it. She never talked about it. She never spoke. But when one looked into it, and I interviewed many of the people, I interviewed virtually everyone alive um, who knew Stalin intimately, um, including some of the top officials who are still alive. And, um, of course, all of them remembered her and, and knew about this. They, they said to me, Stalin didn't have a private life. Um, he, he was a public figure. But when you started to talk to them about it, and that was the official sort of communist line, of course, which was rubbish. Um, but when you actually went further than that and you, you penetrated and you got to their trust, they would remember Valetchka and talk about Valetchka. And she was a, quite a character. By the way, at, at this stage, if you had to write another book uh, off of one of the characters in this one, who would you pick? It would have to be Beria. Um, Barry is the most fascinating. I mean, after Stalin, Barry was the most gifted, um, the most gifted of, of these people, and the most appalling. I mean, he was just a diabolical figure, um, uh, super intelligent, a brilliant manager. And his daughter-in-law, who was one of the people who I'd, who'd never been interviewed before, who I found, she, um, she, uh, fam she said that if Barry had come to America, he'd have risen to be chairman of General Motors, which is interesting. I think we have a picture of him. We'll put it on the screen. Uh, what, what was he like? There he is. Um, he was um, coarse. Which one is he in there? He's the one on the right holding his hat. That's typical barrier. Um, while Molotov, who's in the middle, is wearing, um, looks like a, a clerk on Wall Street, um, Barry on the right looks like a southern sort of Italian wine grower. And he's, he always wore um, no tie, um, soft hat. And um, he, he's pretty fat. And um, he wears pince nez glinting in the sun. And there he is visiting Berlin right at the end of the war, triumphant visit. Um, he was a pervert, of course, a rapist, someone who drove the streets of Moscow in his black limousine, um, picking up girls, sending his bodyguards to pick up girls which, whom he raped. Um, How do you know that? Um, we, we've talked to a lot of them, and um, we found a lot of them. And, um, of course, when they said they were raped, this is one of the interesting things, the secret police chiefs had a special sort of power over life and death. And they could say, um, you know, your father's in prison. If you don't want him shot, perhaps you'd like to do something for me. And so they were great debauchees, these people. I mean, he was preapic. He was obsessed with women. He caught VD tw twice during the war, and, um, which was great embarrassment, of course, but Stalin heard about it. Um, he, was, um, he, was, he was a sadist, personally. He would torture people himself and was very creative about it. When he heard that one woman um, uh, hated snakes, he had snakes put in her cell. Um, he was a great poisoner. He had people poisoned. He belonged in the history of the Borgias, and yet he was super capable, super intelligent. Um, nothing was beyond his capabilities. Um, he was quite educated. He was an architect. And he was a lovely sort of father and, um, and, and husband and, 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 and also a father-in-law. And, you know, I'm very lucky that I managed to find one of the great contributors to this book is his daughter-in-law, who lived in his house um, with him um, and for eight years, and so knew him very well. What's her name? She's called Martha Peshkova. She's also Gorky, Maxim Gorky's granddaughter. So she knew Stalin from childhood. Then she was Svetlana Stalin's um, best friend. Then Svetlana Stalin was in love with Beria's son and um, wanted to marry him. But Martha Peshkova did marry him and join the Beria family. And of course, part of this, I've got to know the Beria grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So I know the Beria family. Not something I ever thought I'd boast of. But, you know, fascinating people. And you can see from that how incestuous this little world was. What a bizarre, tiny little world of seething hatreds, 
um, incestuous relationships this was. Beria did what? What was his highest rank? And um, he was Politburo member. He was secret police chief from 1938. First of all, he ran Georgia in the 30s, which was the sort of um, the country on the um, on the Black Sea where Stalin came from, part of the Soviet Union. Um, and then he was promoted um, to um, in 1938 to be head of the dreaded secret police. And then he became a really fearsome character. I mean, people were terrified of him. Um, he continued the terror. He was he was a brilliant administrator of terror. Um, and he, he later he ran the nuclear bomb um, administration. So it was thanks to him that the Soviet Union got the A-bomb. And of course, that was his huge contribution to history, and he knew that. And he knew if he failed as well, he might well lose his head for it. Where did you find Martha Peskova? All of them were through sort of friends of friends of friends. This little world of families that knew Stalin is still intact, and they all still know each other. And it's very hard to get to them. I mean, some of them are quite well known. Um, there are various ones who appear in every documentary, but the really interesting ones have never really spoken before. And I had to win their trust. And um, that's quite a difficult thing to do. And, but gradually I went from one to the other. Was only, you had to get one, and when you got one, then they'd say, have you spoken to so-and-so? And I'd say, like, no, I'd love to. Are they still alive? You know? And they'd say, yes, they're still alive. We can, we can, I'll call them right now. So it was like putting together a sort of mosaic. Do you speak Russian? Quite badly, but good enough to um, good enough to get to get to know these people. Where did you find her, Martha Peskova? Yeah, physically, where is she? She is li still living on Gorky's, her grandfather's estate, which is just outside Moscow. Gorky, the most famous writer of the Stalin period, and um, so she was like a child of complete privilege. Um, she was the ultimate Soviet princess. I mean, she and Stalin's daughter. It was not for nothing they were best friends. They were the two. They were the children of the two most. They were the families of the two most famous people in the Soviet Union. And you talked to Svetlana, or did you talk to Svetlana? No, I never spoke I to Svetlana. Ask, but you told a very interesting story in here about where she is today and where she lived. Yeah, Go she, trace that. Well, she's been all over the place. You know, she's had a she's she's had a very turbulent life. I think she's in Wisconsin now, I believe. Um, and I did try I try approached her, but I think she's just tired of being Stalin's daughter, and I, which is understandable. Um, she left the Soviet Union twice. She married an American at one point called Peters. Um, she returned to Russia, she returned, to, she was in England. She's been everywhere. And recently she's just moved to America. She's had a terrible life and, you know, being Stalin's family has been a sort of curse. That's partly what this, this book's a story of. It's, it's of the families, you know, the women, the wives especially. And, um, but also it's about what it was like to be a child. You know, there were about 20 people in this inner circle and they'd known each other for 30 years and they rose to power and they killed millions of people, and then they killed, started killing each other. And, um, and th th that's the story. So it was a very peculiar and extraordinary and unique time in history that these people grew up. And that's why, to this day, they're linked together, and why one had to immerse oneself in this, to try and imagine how it felt to be there. And, um, and I think that you know, the materials that I had, both interviews and these new archives, and the visits to the houses and so on, really, I mean, one had to have all three to really put this together and create this, this new picture of, 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 of what it was like in, in, the, in Stalin's court. Because we were talking about Beria, go to the end at Stalin's last couple of days ah. and set that up. And by the way, before you do that, how long did he live, Stalin? 74 years. From when to when? 1878 to 1953, 5th of March, 1953, he died. And how, much, how many of those years was he in power? Well, he was really in power from much earlier than anyone realized. I mean, Lenin died in 1924, but one of the interesting things is when you look at this, he was really running the Soviet Union from 1923 as the first of a sm small group of people. Um, from 1929, he was the leader. Um, and, um, and from 1937, he was the, the leader with absolute power of life over, and death over everybody. So it, it was a sort of, it, grew, it was very slow. He was very cautious, extremely clever politician, subtle. And he meandered his way to where he wanted to get to. And that's one of the things that are different in this book, by the way, about the, you know, normally it's just presented, he's just, he just bursts on the scene and, and sort of after Lenin's death as this kind of dreaded, satanic, omniscient sort of demigod, um, seething with evil, evil and, and, and absolute power. Not true. You know, one of the things this shows is that you know, until 1937, when he suddenly unleashed this great terror, he wasn't a figure of fear to people at all. In fact, they were so intimate with him. They were, hap they were happy. With, you know, they, they felt very comfortable with him. And indeed, 
You know, one of the fascinating things I found was in 1935, when most books say the terror had already begun and everyone was quivering with fear, he invited the Svenidzis, who were a couple who were very close to him, um, almost fat, they were family. He invited them to dinner. They forgot to turn up. They forgot to turn up to dinner with Stalin, you know, which gives you an idea. They were so comfortable with him. They remembered two hours late and they turned up. And Stalin was grumpily um, playing billiards with his bodyguards. Well, these people were shot two years later, um, uh, or arrested two years later and later shot, not for missing dinner, but because they interfered with Stalin's feeling of separateness, his messianic uh, mission. He felt very special. It wasn't for nothing that you know, we discovered that he loved watching Cow John Ford, American movies, directed by John Ford, often with John Wayne in them. Um, he loved that because that's exactly how he saw himself, it turns out, as a sort of the lone cowboy, always alone, no family, an, an invented name, no friends, just the mission, riding alone into town, gunslinging, you know, ready to shoot out at anything. That was him, a Marxist cowboy. And that's in a way how he saw himself and why he spent his last eight years just watching cowboy film after cowboy film, night after night, running the Soviet Union from his private cinema. That's one, that's the sort of, that's very much the picture after the war. So at the end, where is he? He's at his house at Kuntsevo. Kuntsevo is Kuntsevo is what, is what his dacha just outside Moscow. I mean, the, one of the things one discovers in this, in, in, in this story is that Stalin didn't really live in the Kremlin. I mean, Russians thought he lived in the Kremlin and everyone else thought he lived, but in fact he lived at these country houses. And his main residence in, around Moscow was Kuntsevo, this um, two-storey, rather ugly mansion, which he'd built for himself after his wife's death and moved in there. And that's where he lived. He used to shut himself in at night. Guards were in guard houses right about. Inside this house, he had two dining rooms, various bedrooms, and a library, his beloved library in a cottage next to it. Have you, have you been there? No, I haven't been there. It's closed. And in fact, no connections I could pull would get me there. But what is marvellous is that I've, he, had, he had exactly the same house built in the south, 15 of these different houses. Some of them are imperial palaces converted. Some of them are special Stalin houses built for him. And I've been to all of them. And, um, and in fact, there's a story there which, which, I, which, which is kind of interesting and talks about how relevant Stalin is today. I went down to these 15 houses, um, which are fascinating. I photographed them in the book, and uh, no one's ever been there. And when I was going around them, um, I had to fly by UN helicopter into this bandit um, torn republic called Abkhazia on the Black Sea, which is beautiful, but, but, but in a terrible situation. I went around all the houses, extraordinary buildings, all of them. And as I went around them, I said to one of the old ladies who were caring for them, I said, by the way, has anyone you know, been here? A bit worried that you know, Taubman or Anne Applebaum or Richard Pikes would have been there the day before. They said, no, 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 no one's been here for years, they said. Um, in fact, you're the only person to see all of them, except in the 1970s we had a, an Arab visitor, an Arab gentleman who came, and he insisted on seeing every single house that Stalin had lived in. And I said, who was that? And they said, Saddam Hussein. And of course, Saddam was obsessed with Stalin and um, based himself on Stalin. And in fact, they were, they were born about 500 miles apart, if you look at the map, Tikrit, Gori, very close. And um, interesting, I've spoken to some people recently who've... Um, who've been talking to, who talk, were talking to the people who were close to Saddam. And apparently he, was, he read every single book on Stalin, converted into Arabic. And more than that, he, on his last you know, years, he was constantly saying, I study Stalin because there's a man who was in, in power for 30 years and died peacefully in his bed. Neither of which Stalin's, um, Saddam is going to achieve, I think. But uh, we may never get to the death scene. But I want, no, no, that's right. I, no, yes. I want to ask you, though, about the UN helicopter. How did you get the UN to fly in? Um, well, I, I, you had to sort of, you had to, um, I had to sort of um, negotiate with them for ages. Cause why, why would they even take you in at all? I don't know. I managed to get them to. I, you know, that's one of the things you have. To, these books are like detective stories. You know, you have to. I, 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 the reason, the answer is, I got the British ambassador to ask them to take me in. Um, the English ambassador to Georgia, which is now an independent country. But you know, this book was such an adventure. I mean, everything about it was an adventure. You know, whether an intellectual adventure or a physical adventure. This was part of the physical adventure. Um, and um, in, it was quite scary because the UN helicopters had been shot down recently by sort of no one knows who by it, just shot out of the sky. They're Russian helicopters, so they're terrifying to travel in in the first place. There's always sort of fuel leaking out of somewhere, you know. But I had to get to these houses, and in fact it was very important. So much of what happened, especially after the war, so much of the Cold War, the Korean War, Stalin's part in the Korean War, happened at these houses in the south. Stalin was there for six months of every year um, after the war. So... 
you know, it was very, very important that I got, I got to see these places. Did he go to all 15? All of them, all the time. He moved around all the time. And in every room, he slept in every room. And he had all sorts of strange sort of details I discovered. Like, for example, the baths were all t tiny because they were made exactly to fit him. And he was just, he was sort of just not much over five foot. It was tiny. And, um, and so the baths were actually, all of them were exactly his size. When I got into one of these baths, and I, might, I could hardly sort of, I couldn't lie down in it, you know, it was, it was tiny. Um, By the way, you say in your book he was 5'6". Five, 5'6", six. Five, six. Yeah. Five, six. Yeah. So just a bit, a bit over 5 foot, that's right. Uh, and so um, the UN flew you to each one of them? No, they flew me in and then they said, we can't guarantee your safety in this place, but you're on your own now. And I met up with the sort of Abkhazian professor who was called Slava Lakoba, who knew this story, these places inside out. He's the sort of expert there locally. He took me round to all these houses. And they are, some of them are very beautiful houses. It's normally written that they're very grim, ugly, um, you know, sort of, but in fact, they're rather beautiful. But the fascinating thing about all of them is that they're all invisible. I mean, wherever you are looking up at them, you can't see them. And yet from that, that he obviously chose them as eeries, you know, like Hitler, he loved being in the sky, you know. And they're really beautiful. I mean, they often have sort of summer houses built on the edge of a cliff overhanging the sea. They always, um, had their own paths and um, little pagodas, and often Stalin would walk down these little paths and have a picnic outside. I mean, the Stalin of Georgia was different from the grim character we think of in, 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 in Moscow. So the deathbed, the, the, death the quiet death scene. Well, you know, you've got a picture this scene, it's an extraordinary scene. Stalin is now getting older, he's getting forgetful, but he is still, he's 74 years old, he is still the great manager of, of, camp, of struggle, of terror. Um, he's still running this campaign against the, uh, it's basically an anti-American campaign against the Jews, against his own doctors, against his own colleagues. And he's, he's, he's running this sort of anti-Zionist doctor's plot. And, um, and he's suffering from arteriosclerosis. And when his doctors tell him, they say, you've got to stop working so much, you, you're suffering from severe arteriosclerosis. He, he had them arrested. He saw that as an attempted sort of coup against himself, quite rightly, because if he had to work less, they, were they taking power away from him? So he was, um, but he was actually in a very good mood. He loved running, running a purge, running a terror campaign. Um, you know, he, he was never happier when he, was, when he was administering a new sort of terror intrigue. And at the height of this, he has dinner with his usual four companions, Khrushchev, uh, um, um, Malenkov, Beria, Boganin, and himself. And they have their dinner. They get drunk. They talk about these. They talk about the interrogation of the doctors. Um, this is in March of seven. Uh, yeah, this uh, is the twenty eighth of February. Twenty eighth of February, nineteen fifty three. Mm -hmm. And they're at the dacha. They're drinking wine, and they drink till four in the morning or whatever. Eisenhower has just become president. Eisenhower has just become president. Um, and um, the height of the Cold War. The Korean War's going on. Um, American troops are there. Chinese troops are there. Let me um, ask you though, but Bul Bulganin was what at that point? Bulganin was a top Politburo member um, and ran the Defence Ministry um, at various times. Khrushchev? Khrushchev was um, a senior party official running Moscow. Um, uh, Malenkov was Stalin's sort of deputy in the party. Beria was not head of the secret police at this point. Beria was head of the nuclear project and ran a huge part of the economy. He was deputy prime minister. Stalin was prime minister and head of the party, secretary general of the party. You say in your book that Stalin and Beria despised each other. They did. I mean, How, did they know? I mean, did e either did they know about the other despising yeah, them? Yeah, I think they did. I mean, um, Stalin was kind of Stalin. The trouble is that Stalin was Stalin was ultimately a practical politician, and he knew that he, there were plenty of useless people around. But Beria was the most was the most efficient. Was his most brilliant sidekick. So he didn't want to get rid of him, but he wanted to make sure that he. He stayed, you know, submissive. But yeah, they hated each other. Beria had once loved Stalin, but he came to despise him, and Stalin regarded him as a sort of vulgar policeman. We have a picture of uh, Stalin marching in his white outfit there. That's a great picture, isn't it? Now, well, that picture is um, soon after the war. Now, that is Stalin's Generalissimo's uniform, which was specially designed for him. He feared that he looked like a band leader in it. and. Um, and he sort of, some tall officers were brought into his office to model it for him, and he kept trying, you know, but in the end, he wore it. Now, in that picture, far left is? Far left, it goes, Mikoyan is on the far left, dapper, Armenian, very clever, very wily, the man who survived until Brezhnev's time, the great survivor of Soviet. Of well, Soviet we we saw Anastas Mikoyan forever yeah. in our lives. I he mean, came he to JFK's funeral. He was, 
he was Khrushchev's representative of JFK's funeral, so he was he's part of American history too. So he was at JFK's funeral. He was also at Lenin's funeral. He carried. That's right. He's an amazing character. He carried Lenin's coffin, and he attended Jack Kennedy's funeral. That gives you an idea of his span, his political span, a giant of the 20th century. To his left, our right, who is that? Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, toothy, bald, jug-eared bumpkin, um, cunning, tireless, and a, a Stalinist fanatic. And to uh, Stalin's right, Malenkov, flabby, nicknamed um, broad-hipped, um, no, no, didn't need to shave. Um, horrible, sinister character, um, known by all by the uh, by the feminine nickname Melanie, for his feminine femininity, his high voice. And who is the <clears throat> gentleman next to him? Uh, Beria, very unusually dressed as a marshal of the Soviet Union. Um, and we've talked about Beria, pervert, predator, sadist, brilliant manager. On his left, our right. Um, uh, uh, Molotov, the um, foreign minister. The actually, you know, foreign minister. Very famous, urbane diplomat, f- very cold, ruthless, the Robespierre of the um, of the uh, Soviet leadership. Okay, back to February twenty eight. Eight. We're at dinner. We're drinking. The the other four leave. When you say drinking, that, that is that's a theme throughout this whole. Book. Yeah, drinking gets worse and worse and worse. I How mean, much do they? What do they drink? Well, they drink they, they drink a lot of vodka, a lot of brandy, and they drink a lot of Georgian wine, and they also love champansky, you know, G- Crimean champagne, which Stalin adored. But Stalin himself, by this time, was drinking very little. He drank what he called um, a juice, which was sort of Georgian wine with water in it. Um, the others were expected to drink heavily. And they were often sick at the... You know, these, these were sort of vomit-flecked routes. You know, they would, they would often be made to drink and drink and drink, and they would often vomit at the table or just stagger out. Um, how, some, do you, how do you know that? We, we know from all the memoirs of the different people... We've, um, you know, there's, there's no doubt about it. There's, there's absolute strong evidence for this. They would dance together. Um, the they, men. The men would dance because there were no women at these dinners by the end. I mean, these were extraordinary scenes. These were bacchanals. You slow know. dancing? There was slow dancing between men. And in fact, you know, they would often use that to sort of whisper to each other. Molotov would like slow dance with one of the Polish communist leaders. And then he'd whisper in his, he'd whisper in his ear, um, you've got enemies in your army, find them. And then Stalin would, the, the Polish guy would look up and Stalin would be, would be nodding because he'd, he'd have organised this little moment, you know. So these dinners were extraordinary, you know. In fact, Stalin's daughter, Svetlana, would sometimes come down and she said it was like the boyars of Peter the Great. It was, such a, it was so appalling. Stalin's secretary, Poskorobyshev, would, would, be, would be dragged out. Um, he, was the, he was always made to drink the most. He was made to sort of bumper whole glasses of champagne. While we're on that name, uh, <laughs> we may or may not get to the death. And while we're, while death. we're on that name, say it again, because it was the hardest name to pronounce. Who, who was he? He was a key person who no one really has, but he was, he was an extremely ugly little man, um, once a medical orderly, who was Stalin's chef de cabinet. I mean, his what chief of mean? staff. His, his chief of staff. I mean, you know, he was really the chief of staff. I mean, the chief of staff of the White House is a, is a, is a huge well-known public official. But in their world, the chef de cabinet, the chief of staff, was this kind of secret person. And he really ran Stalin's complete political world for him and did everything. Who was in his family? Um, uh, well, he had, a, he had a very pretty wife. What was her name? Who was called Bronka. And she was like Jewish, like many of the women around these people, she was Jewish, flirtatious, sort of semi-Polish. She was Lithuanian, which was, you know, sort of Polish-Lithuanian, um, from a good family. And she had married into this terrible group of people. And, um, and she was like, she was great fun. Stalin liked her. She was flirtatious with Stalin. Um, and, um, but she was distantly related to Trotsky. Fatal, fatal thing to be. Very distantly, like something like her sister's husband was, um, his sister was married to the, the, the son of um, Trotsky, uh, Trotsky's son. So it was very you know, diffuse. Why is that bad? Stalin was obsessed with Trotsky. Trotsky was his great villain, the great enemy. And um, Stalin had made his career by basically destroying Trotsky. Who, who killed Trotsky? Um, Stalin ordered it. Um, he tried to kill him umpteen times. And finally, he called him Beria and Suda Platov, who was this um, sort of master of special tasks in the secret police. And he said, just destroy him. I want him, I want him done, executed in 1940. They found him. They knew where he was, of course, and they infiltrated someone into his circle. And then they killed him with an ice axe. And Stalin was thrilled with that. He gave medals to all the people involved. In Mexico? In Mexico City. Uh, I, I really can't pronounce that name. It's Pos... Poskodobyshov. 
Pos Yeah. Uh, what happened to his wife? Um, well, she made a mistake. Her brother was also arrested, and, and he was a, he was a Kremlin doctor, top top Kremlin doctor. And so she went to Stalin to ask for um, for for his release, and um, and some people say that they had an affair there, which I think is very unli unlikely, probably. But she then went to Beria to ask for the release, and Beria arrested her, and of course her husband was just desperate to um, to get her released, and went to Stalin, and went to Beria, and begged them to release him, and Stalin said. I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, Sasha. That's what he called him. He said, I'm sorry, Sasha, but, you know, if you really miss her, we'll find you another wife. Typical Stalin, sort of horrible, dry joke, gallows humour. And she was kept in prison, and gradually, you know, the ch his chief of staff realised that, that um, he wasn't, his wife was never going to come back. And, um, and she was kept in prison. She was interrogated as a Trotskyite and, and as a Pole and as a Jew. I mean, she had a lot of things working against her, and as someone who'd asked Stalin to release her brother. Stalin hated women coming to him and asking him these embarrassing questions. He resented it enormously. And, um, and Poskodobyshev continued to work as Stalin's loyal, um, dogged um, chief of staff. Did he like him? He loved him. He worshipped him. Even though he took his wife away from him? He thought that was business as usual. I mean, one of the key things in this book to understand is that these weren't like normal people. They weren't like normal politicians. They talked about themselves, these Bolsheviks, as knights in shining armour who would chop off what is rotten. They regarded themselves as a sort of order, armed order of warrior priests, and they believed fanatically in Marxism, Leninism, which meant the random destruction of classes of people now in order to create the perfect workers' paradise later. Did he ever get his wife back? No. She was, um, she was kept in prison, and just as Stalin, in the, in the Second World War, had begun, when, after Hitler had invaded in 1941, um, uh, Stalin had a shot. Um, and, of course, Poskorobyshev knew nothing about this and never quite knew what had happened to her, but he knew that she'd crossed that terrible line. Because in, the, in this group of, group of people, you were a leader. You called all the other leaders comrade or, or by their first names. When you were arrested and you were named as an enemy of the people, you just disappeared. You crossed the line from being a sort of one of these citizens, one of these leaders, an aristocrat, really, an order, an, a member of this order of armed, of armed maniacs, as it were, you crossed that line and you became nothing, like dust. And in fact, they often used to say, Beria, who behaved like a film noir villain a lot of the time, used to say to people, I'll grind you, I'll grind you into camp dust, which is just typical of this sort of horrible people. Okay, February 28th. <laughs> We've got to get they're to the drinking, death, haven't we? and they're drinking a lot. And they're drinking a lot, and they, they're talking about the doctor's confession. Stalin's saying, have you managed to beat a... We've got to beat a confession out of these doctors. Have they admitted yet being agents of the American Zionist conspiracy? And they were talking about that. And they talked about the Korean War, apparently, about how it was time to, maybe it was time to make peace. But Stalin said, no, it's better if we just keep bleeding the West and just keep it going longer. And they split in the early hours, and by about six o'clock the next night, you know, a whole day had gone past, everyone was waiting to hear from Stalin, but no one had heard from him. And, um, and sometime, at that, you know, sometime during that day, Stalin suffered a stroke, and he was in his pyjamas, and he was holding the newspaper and a bottle, of, um, a bottle of mineral water, and he was wandering around in his private apartments, and he, he fell down. He was soaked in, ur in his own urine, and he was lying there and he couldn't move, but he was awake. And he, he was uh, waiting to be discovered. Everyone was, well, the bodyguards were getting very nervous because they never went in, you see, until they were called. And they waited and waited and waited and finally they went in and they saw him, they crept in. The post arrived, so they had an excuse to go in. And then they found him there lying in this position. They were terrified. They, they immediately rang up Beria and Malenkov and all these characters. And they were all terrified too because the doctors had just been arrested for saying he was ill. So they had, to be make, they had to make damn sure he really was ill before they did anything. And that's why Stalin was sort of left for 12 hours, effectively, lying in his own urine, waiting to be got up, getting colder and colder. I mean, his staff lifted him up and put him on a sofa. And then after a while... By the way, you have a picture in the book of a sofa. I do, yeah, I have a and, picture and, of the and sofa. And you say he had those everywhere. He had them everywhere. I, I've seen many of them. And they're all the same. They're all huge, so you can actually sleep on them. And he moved around, and he said, he, he, he said, he said I always move around. He, he told visitors, he used to say, I don't sleep in the beds here, he said. I sleep in the sofas. And I move around. Every night I sleep in a different one. He, he always went to sleep reading. You know, he was an obsessional reader. He'd just lie there, and he, he was an insomniac. 
He told Churchill, he said, I'd never get to sleep till four at least. That's why he had these dinners. And then he'd just, he'd just read a history book or literature or something, and then he'd, just, um, he'd finally fall asleep wherever he happened to be. And that was the way he liked it. It was a habit he'd got. You know, these people were formed by their life as underground, itinerant revolutionaries. And Stalin never really lost the habits of this itinerant, being an itinerant revolution. He loved that. He loved that life, really. He was born for it. And so even when he was leader of the, the greatest empire in the world, he still lived in that way. Though, of course, on a vast scale, with 15 or 20 houses kept staffed at all times. But anyway, to get back to the death... <laughs> um, uh, anyway, so there you have him. He's lying on the floor. He's lying on, he's lying on the floor, sort of begging to be got up. He can't speak. He's had his stroke. He's had a huge stroke, a fatal stroke. And right. By the way, you say that he had a pulse of 78 and his blood pressure was 190 over 110. Yeah. And normal is, what, 120 over 70 yeah. or something? I'm not sure what stage that, that, that is, but whenever it, when, that was when he was first med, med, examined medically, I guess. It but, was early. Yeah, but this, this, when we're talking, he still hasn't even been... He still hasn't been really sort of... No, one, no doctors have seen him yet. They're just waiting to see. They think he might just have a hangover, and they're waiting to see if he's going to wake up. And meanwhile, none of them dare go in. They come and they go, and Beria meets Khrushchev. And Khrush they can't find Beria at first, but he's clearly with some woman. He's got this... This time, by the way, he had a 14-year-old mistress, a gorgeous 14-year-old mistress. Yeah, a 14-year-old mistress who was, who was absolutely, absolutely beautiful girl. And how old would he have been? Oh, well, he was 53, 54. And, um, and she was kept in all the finest houses, and she had her own driver, and, you know, this was sort of... You know, this was really... A, it wasn't a very communist life they were leading by this point. You know, this is, this is really about privilege, about a ruling class. But anyway, they finally found Beria, and he said, just leave it, be careful. Um, you know, don't go in there. And finally, they, they waited till the staff were desperate. The staff kept ringing and said, we've got to have a doctor. You know, we think he really is ill. So finally, the leaders drove up outside. And the they, four. The four. And they had this frantic negotiation about what, who would go in. And in the end, they crept in. Beria and Malenkov, the dominant people, really, the, sort of the two leading officials, crept in. And Beria was typical Beria, sort of arrogant and, um, and, and uh, haughty. Malenkov, who was sort of Melanie Malenkov, as he was nicknamed by the other leaders, um, took his shoes off, typically, and carried them. You know, so he was walking along in his socks. He was terrified of, terrified of um, Stalin waking up and t asking what he was doing there. And they looked in, and finally they began to figure out that maybe he, he was ill. But they decided, let's wait till morning, so we'll see what's happened. So now we're really talking, it's many hours since Stalin's had the stroke. And in the morning, it's clear that he really is ill. They call the doctors, the leaders turn up. And then they begin fighting for the, um, for, the, for, the, for the succession, and they begin to make deals. Then you've got Stalin's son, Vasily, drunk, drunk, useless son, coming in, shouting at them all, you bastards have killed my father. You've got Khrushchev and Beria bargaining in the back, you know, the, in the back room. There are all these doctor, young doctors hanging around. The, the specialist doctors are too frightened to touch him. And in fact, when they started to examine him, their hands were shaking so much that they couldn't get his shirt off. He was wearing a shirt now. They put on a, um, they put a dressing gown and shirt. They, he was cold when they found him, you see. And so they, they said, um, go on to examine him. And this, um, this specialist, this professor, started sort of trying to... And he just... He, he had these scissors. He was going to try and cut the shirt off, and he just dropped it. So Barry said to him, pull yourself together, examine him properly. He's your patient. So it was kind By of... By the way, how old was Vasily, his son, then? Oh, his Vasily was 1921. So he was 30, you know, he was in his 30s. Um, 21 or 50, you know, he was, he was, yeah, he was, he was in his, and he was in his 30s, and and the, um, and then they tried to get his false teeth out. We have a picture of it. The there he is. There he is, the crown prince, as he was known by by all the inner circle. By the way, hold the false teeth story because yeah. while you're on him, just for a moment, <laughs> yeah. what was the May Day story when he was fired because mm. of uh, yeah. the bombers? He was grossly overpromoted. Um, he really was ridiculously spoilt. Half terrified, half complete, a complete bully, typical mixed dictator's son. He was a sort of Uday, the Uday Saddam Hussein of the regime, if you like. And he, he was drunk, he was a general of the Air Force, and he, had, he was always flying drunk. And typically, during a very um, bad weather, he gave orders that these bombers could fly over the fly pass on Red Square, which we've all seen on the news, um, where the leaders from, from Lenin's mausoleum viewed these fly passes and parades. And two of the planes crashed, well, one of the planes crashed, and, um, and Stalin was furious and sacked him. And then, it, then Stalin had to face up to the fact that Vasily was a, was, a, was a completely chronic alcoholic. And then Stalin put, insisted on putting him, Stalin was very concerned, and he put him into the sort of Soviet version of the Betty Ford Clinic, 
which was, you know, obviously the, this whole group of people were such a collection of sort of murderers, drunks, sadists. I mean, you know, the, the, um, they, they were just they were just a group of sort of degenerates essentially. And Vasily Stalin was the classic. And you know, it wasn't for nothing they called him the Crown Prince. Let me read from the death chapter. Uh, once he was, it was proved that he was incapacitated. Yeah. Beria, quote, spewed forth his hatred of Stalin, unquote. But whenever his eyelids flickered or his eyes opened, Beria, terrified that he would recover, quote, knelt and kissed his hand like an oriental, was it, vizier? Vizier, yeah. Vizier, uh, at uh, Sultan's bedside. That's right, that's right. I mean, I mean you, but you have a couple of occasions yeah. in here where Beria, yeah. when, when his eyelids were closed, he think he was out, he started screaming yeah. hatred to him. Yeah, I mean, he'd, virtually, he'd say, he'd, you know, he was basically sort of saying, die, you revolting old man, when Stalin was when Stalin was unconscious, and when, when his eyelids flickered, he'd throw himself on the floor, kiss his hand, say, Comrade Stalin, we long for you to return, will you, will you come back and, you know, will you lead us? I mean, Beria is a film noir character. And of course, this was Beria's undoing. He wasn't, he wasn't sensible, you know, he, he couldn't help showing off. He thought he was cleverer than everybody else. He frightened everybody else, and that, was, that doomed him in the end. We also say here that perhaps 20 million had been killed, 28 million deported, of whom 18 million had slaved in the gulags, yet after so much slaughter they were still believers. Yeah. Now, did you have a total figure of how many humans Stalin was responsible for killing, murdering, or starving? You know, we'll never know. Um, What's your most, best guess? I, I think something like 30 million. I think something like 30 million. But that, that line is the most, one of the most important in the book. You know, after after, say, 30 million had died, after 30 million had been through camps and deportation. You know, so we're talking 60 million victims of this, of this, this monstrous regime, these, these absolute diabolical characters. They still believed. They believed until they died. They, they were absolute fanatics. And that's, that's the key. They were religious fanatics. And they had much more in common with the Taliban or the Ayatollahs or Osama bin Laden, in a way, than they did with a secular party. They talked all the time about this, as I said, they talked... When Stalin was killing people, I found notes in these amazing archives, which I found, which I was using, which, in which he said, you know, we've got to kill these people, we've got to finish them off, because they've lost faith. Which is interesting. Interesting choice of words. So the teeth, the false teeth. We're back at the bedside now, and you know, they, they've just managed to shakily take off Stalin's shirt, but they're so frightened. And then, you know, when it's time to take out their teeth, they're so frightened, they drop the teeth. They take out Stalin's false teeth, they drop them on the floor, they go... Stalin's dentures go clattering across the um, across the floor of um, the dacha, and um, and then they begin to you know they, then they finally Stalin lies there, and they begin the, the doctors begin to examine him, and they find out that he is incapacitated as you said, and that um, and that Stalin is never going to come back, and then they begin this sort of wheel. They actually keep him alive longer, rather like they did with Mao Chairman Mao and with Brezhnev in fact. They sort of and with Marshal Tito, it's a sort of it's a sort of feature of these sort of regimes. They keep him alive, especially longer, in order to check that everything's settled. The collective leadership is in place. And, of course, they bargain to let each other, each other off the blame for various atrocities as well. Deals are being made, and the old man's breathing there, surrounded by his daughter, the drunk son, Vasily, and, um, and all the leadership. Fascinating moment. When does he die? He dies in the evening of the 5th of March, 1953. And um, Beria has managed to secure for himself the dominant position of control of all the security services, the whole Gulag Empire, as well as being, you know, keeps him deputy prime minister. Beria darted forward and ritually kissed the warm body first, the equivalent of a wrenching a dead king's ring off his finger. Yeah. Where did you find that? Um, well, I, I said that it was the equivalent of um, taking the, you know, the, how they used to rip the the, the no, but I mean, where'd you find the story of the um, details on there? Various, there are all sorts of accounts. I mean, Mikoyan left an account, Kaganovich left an account, Svetlana left an account. We have quite a lot of accounts of these scenes now. Molotov cried, mourning Stalin despite his own imminent liquidation and that of his wife. That's right. How were they liquidated? Um, they weren't liquidated, they were about to be liquidated. Molotov was Stalin's oldest um, comrade, his, um, the second man of the regime in the public eye, anyway. Stalin had turned against him and Star Molotov's wife, was Paulina, was a Jewess, and she had met Golda Meir when Golda Meir visited um, Moscow in 1948. And she'd re she was a Bolshevik, a tough woman, a hard Bolshevik woman who believed in all this killing, who believed in the whole regime, the whole of Stalinism. Paulina. 
Polina. And, and by the way, Golda Meir used to run Israel. Was the That's right. Prime she was Minister Prime Minister of Israel. From Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That's right. Okay. Golda Meirson from, Mil from Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Um, so, but she'd, you know, she, but she'd, she'd always start annoyed Stalin. Part of the reason, for her, the reason was that she was Jewish. Part of the reason that she was very independent. Part of the reason was that she was a sort of feminist and therefore had risen to being a minister in the government in her own right. But part of it was that she'd been best friends with Stalin's wife, the late Nadia, who'd committed suicide. And Stalin never really forgave Polina for being that close to, um, to, to Nadia. And so he'd always sort of planned to destroy her. And he'd almost destroyed her in 1939. In fact, he, at one point he said, should we, should we kill her? He said to Beria, should we kill her in a um, faked car crash? Anyway, but they decided not to. And she survived another 10 years. And then in 1948-49, she was arrested. And she was accused of having sexual relations with hundreds of young men in sort of Politburo gangbangs, if you like, which is just completely unbelievable sort of accusation. She was accused of having group sex. Um, and she was a, you know, a respectable grandmother and matron by this point, so it was completely ludicrous. And Star Molotov was sitting at the table when Stalin read out these accusations, and he said, my knees were knocking. I realised that this was very serious. So what happened to the two of them? Well, nothing happened to um, Molotov except that he had to vote for her um, leaving the party. He had to divorce her. And um, she was then arrested, and, um, and she was put, taken, taken away, sent into exile. And he did not see her for three, more year, for three or four more years, and he believed she was probably dead. She wasn't. In fact, she was kept secretly. And he continued to be a member of the Politburo. He, sa he was sacked as foreign minister, but he, remembered he, he continued to be deputy premier, to work um, all the time. Um, he ceased to be Stalin's most trusted person, and in fact, Stalin hardly saw him anymore and saw him less and less. Stalin despised him by then. Because we we don't have much time, I want to uh, get to Beria for a moment. Yeah. Who, uh, he became the leader? He became the first man of a collective, um, a collective regime, the power. He became the sort of power man. How long? Just for 100 days, three months. Who eliminated him? Khrushchev. Who killed him? Um, a marshal, a general, was brought in to kill him. And, um, and he was arrested in a sort of coup. And, um, after the 100 days? After the 100 days, Khrushchev arranged it. Everyone else signed off on it. They arrested him. They kept him in secret for some months. Then they tried him. He wrote letters to them all saying, please release me. And then they, they took him out and they sentenced him to death. And he started shouting and saying, you can't kill me. I'm burying And They stuffed the towel in his mouth. And then they couldn't find anyone. Everyone was too frightened to shoot him. So they, got, they had to get a, a very senior officer to kill him. They got a general, an obscure general. They got him out. He came out and he just shot him right in the forehead. Um, and um, then he was cremated, and, and his ashes were thrown into one of those graveyards in Moscow where so many of his victims' ashes had also been thrown. Where is Stalin today? He is, he is um, apparently quite well preserved, but against the Kremlin wall, buried under the Kremlin wall, and there's a statue of him there behind Lenin's mausoleum. But no, one, no, t no tour guide will point it out to you. And Lenin's still in his tomb? Lenin's still in his tomb. Yep. When you say the Kremlin, uh, you've been there. Yeah. Did you go through, I mean, explain what the Kremlin is. Well, the Kremlin is fascinating. It isn't, it isn't like the White House. It's not one building. It's 69 acres, a sort of, um, almost like a sort of medieval Russian um, Disney world of history. I mean, it's got, you know, you've got Ivan the Terrible buried there. You've got churches, courtyards, palaces. And, of course, all these people, the whole leadership lived in, these, in about two buildings in, inside the Kremlin and saw each other every day. Their families were next to each other. Um, they often had doors into each other's apartments. Um, the Stalins, the, the Mikoyans, the Molotovs, the Berries all lived close at hand. Not the Berries, in fact, but they all lived very close together. And one of the fascinating things in the notes uh, uh, that I discovered, which the book's based on, the archives, which the book is really based on, Stalin's own papers, love letters, photo albums, etc., is that they would constantly pop into each other's apartments. It was very informal. Power was personal there. And you'd often find little notes that say, hey, Molotov, I dropped into your apartment. You weren't there. I'll come back later, Stalin. And you, you know. find this, you found them. The, 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 these, these, these documents, yeah, I've actually held these documents and worked on them. Let me ask you, because um, I want to get your own story in. Where are you from originally? I, I'm from England. Where? From London. Where'd you go to school? I went to high school at, at Harrow School. Which was, um, which was where Winston Churchill went to school and, and quite a lot of prime ministers. And then I studied history at Cambridge University. Um, and then I did very, I became an investment banker for a while. And uh, my family's a banking family originally, so I thought I might follow, follow, that, um, follow that sort of tradition. But 
I, in 1991, the Soviet Union started to break up. And then I realised that I, my destiny was to see this history being made. So I went out there and became a sort of um, self-employed war correspondent. Had you spoken Russian before that? No, I didn't speak a word of Russian then, not a word. I went out there, I was in Chechnya, I was in Georgia, I was, in, I was sitting on a tank when, they, when Boris Yeltsin was attacking his own White House in that famous scene in 1993, you probably remember. I mean, it was a life of tremendous adventure. And you're what, 39 now? Or... I'm 38 now, so I was then 20 six or seven or something and it was a tremendous thing you know I was just living this amazing life as a sort of retired banker traveling to these places and of course everywhere I went civil war broke out I got to know the president the warlord the you know the, 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 I was traveling in these amazing convoys of black Mercedes with guys with guns hanging off the um, you know the, the walking the, the, the boards on the edge of them it was just a great adventure and but I also had some very frightening things happen to me that made me realize I didn't really want to be shot at that by people who didn't even care who I was and Grozny was the last straw. It was very frightening. So then, um, so then after that, I'm, I, I loved the Caucasus, and that got me interested in history. I was a columnist for the Sunday Times in London and a spectator, and I wrote a lot for the New Republic here, um, mainly on Russia. And then I started to write history books. I became a historian, full-time historian. And um, my first history book was about Prince Potemkin, Catherine the Great's lover. And that was based on correspondence that no one had really seen before as well. And that's one. I mean, that's a great story. That's the great sort of one of the great um, love stories of all of history. Catherine and Potemkin. Forget forget Antony and Cleopatra or Napoleon and Josephine. These were amazing people. Did did you have a uh, an interpreter when you would interview people like uh, Martha Peshkova? Yeah, I used an interpreter then. My Russian's not would not be good enough to. Um, to I wouldn't want to risk missing stuff. Did you tape those interviews? Yeah, we taped those interviews. How many did you do? You think? Fifty, I should think. Total of all the old... Yeah. I mean, how many of those folks are still Stalinists? A lot of them are. I mean, some of them are just terrifying. I mean, Andreev was one of the... Andreev and Dora Khazan were the man and woman who were Stalin's two closest and most vile um, uh, collaborators. Their daughter, and Natasha Andreeva, I interviewed her. She turned out to be a terrifying character. She leaned over towards me and she said, you know, she said, my mother could tell an enemy of the people just by looking into his eyes. She's, um, and my mother told me, she said, that I had inherited that gift. And then she leant right over to me and she pointed at me and she said, Simon, are you an enemy of the people? Are you afraid of the red flag? And I was pretty, I was pretty afraid at that moment, as you can imagine. But it interestingly, she also said, and by the way, she said, my father never killed half the people that you, you, know, that you say he killed and, you, you know, and Stalin killed. It's not, not true. And that day, funnily enough, I worked in the archives. I wanted to believe her. But that day I went to the archives, I found Andreev's, her father's file. And it was a catalogue of absolute um, mass murder. On a, it was a sort of magical mystery tour of murder around the whole Soviet Union. There'd be telegrams that said, to Stalin, from Andreev. I've arrived in Rostov, I've, arrest, I've arrested the entire agricultural, ultra, agricultural college, five ministers, six party leaders, seven soldiers, 25 of this, 26 of that, two TV presenters and news readers or whatever, and he, and he said, I asked her, they're all enemies of the people, can I execute all of them? And Stalin would just write back, Pravilna, right, go right ahead. And um, these, are all on, these are all actually on bit of bits of paper you can read. In addition to all this, you and your wife are somewhat known in Great Britain or in England as, uh, I don't know what, how to describe it, They'd, you're friends of the royals. We, we know that we, we are friends of the royals. Friends yes. of Prince Charles. We are friends of Prince Charles. How did that all come? How long have you been um, married? Um, we've been married about five years, and um, my wife's um, mother is is the Prince of Wales. Well, one of the Prince of Wales' best friends. I, I think it's probably true to say. And um, so, when we got you know when we got married, and you know the Prince of Wales and Mrs. Parker Bowles came to our wedding, and all this kind of this stuff. So it's kind of interesting. We've we've. Um, we love them, I and mean, we, 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 I adore the Prince of Wales, and I think he's a, he's a wonderful person, a great friend. Did too. that ever help in, in getting access to some of this stuff? You talk about the British ambassador to Russia helping you open up uh, the, you know, the flights in the UN. Is that, does that spill over? No, not really. I, I, never, I, I wouldn't sort of, I, I, keep, I generally don't sort of talk, tell, to involve it with my work, really. I mean, I think it's best to keep these things separate. Where'd you meet your wife? Um, uh, I met her, I met her I, she was actually working in a shop at one point. Her name's Santa? Santa, Santa, sort of South American name. Um, yeah, I met, her in a, I met her in a shop, funny enough, and I thought, my God, she's beautiful, I, I must find out who she is. 
and um, and later I did, and um, the rest is history. How many kids? We've got two kids. How old? Um, one's three, Lily, and one's a boy called Sasha. Nice Russian name. And your wife's a writer. She's a writer. She writes um, she writes romantic um, sagas, um, normally with a South American. She speaks very good Spanish, so she and she knows South America very well. So they normally have a Latin. They always normally have some gauchos in there. Where did you do all this work? I mean, how do you all? Were you both writers? You work in the same place? Bizarrely, our, our, our sort of our flat, our, our living conditions have deteriorated since we've had children. Since we we're running out of room. So at one point, we were actually I was writing Starlin, and she was writing her romantic novels in one room. You know, we, we shared a study. The, the kids have run riot around the rest of the house. So bizarrely, we'd be writing these completely opposite. She'd be writing these wonderful, sweeping love stories, while I'd be just immersed in this in this chronicle of just murder and perversity. Are you a fast writer? I'm a pretty fast writer. How many words a day? Um, I don't know, thousands. I mean, I'd play music very loudly to get, to get it through. Often I'd play Russian, the Red Army Choir I listened to a lot when I was writing this. Shelby Foote says that he writes about 500 words a day, that's all. Well, sometimes I, sometimes I don't get much done. I mean, there's some really difficult, I worked really hard on this book. I mean, I really wanted, when did you finish this book? I finished it just over a year ago and I I mean what I was trying to do it, it was, was just trying to write a book that even if no one for people who'd never read a, read a book on Stalin you know who might never read another book on Stalin this should be the, the Stalin book that they read that's what I wanted to do but I also wanted it to be completely scholastically um, founded in um, in the archives and I, and I hope that it, that, that it succeeds in that our guest has been Simon Seabag Montefiore. This is the cover of the book, Stalin, The Court of the Red Czar. Thank you very much. Thank you. For a DVD or videotape, call 1-877-ON-C-SPAN. For a free transcript or to learn more about Book Notes, visit us at booknotes.org. Next week on Book Notes, part two of the interview with Simon Seabag Montefiore, author of Stalin, the Court of the Red Tsar. Book Notes can be seen every Sunday on C-SPAN at 8 p.m. Eastern and 8 p.m. Pacific Time. On Book TV tonight, author Bill Salmon on his book, Miss Underestimated, The President Battles Terrorism, John Kerry, and the Bush Haters. That's on C-SPAN 2 in a few moments at 9 p.m. Eastern. Students and leaders, New York City. Time Warner Cable and C-SPAN teamed up.